Welcome to the We Are Libertarians daily podcast. I am your guest host, Hody Johns. I am here with another guest host, Sarah Brady Wagner. Sarah, are you excited to be here today? I'm always excited to be here. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Me too. I am more excited that we could end up making this thing happen. It's been an eventful day for both of us. I, uh, you mentioned you were painting your house, and I was wondering what hair, what color the hair was going to be, how much was going to be the nice purple pink, and how much was going to be paint. So. Well, I, I'm good about, you know, you change clothes, put it back, <laughs> we do it little by little. There's, there's no time that we get like the whole kitchen painted at once. <laughs> You, see, you must be a girl because me as a guy, if I paint the kitchen, I'll paint the kitchen, but my hair color would be whatever color I was painting the kitchen. Like, uh, you know, a nice lime green look. Uh, I can serve paint better. <laughs> that's probably it. Well, let's get into it. Like I said, we only got 20 to 30 minutes here, but we have, I guess I'd say a good episode. Really, it's a bummer of an episode, but it's something that needs to be talked about. Um whether you've been to prison or not, we're going to talk, we're going to try to keep it specific here because there's a lot to talk about with reforming the prison system. A lot. I think everybody from every political spectrum believes that. So it's funny that we haven't got around to it, but we're going to keep this specific to prison labor if we can. Um, I understand that you have some personal experience to share on the subject, not to throw you under the bus there for your future <laughs> employers, but, uh, well, I've already talked about it on a couple podcasts. So, uh, okay. if anybody who doesn't know, I have been to jail, not prison. Oh, okay. The difference, the difference being, jail is where you go for less than a year, and prison is where you go if you're going away for more than a year. Oh, okay. The year, uh, but, the year long is the okay. Yeah, but in both cases, there is uh, inmate labor, uh, which is the uh, generally the policy term around it, and basically, it's the kind of work that you are given the opportunity to do in jail and it does not fall under any of the laws that any other kind of work it does. Well, you lose a certain amount of your rights when you go to jail slash prison. I don't think there's any way to retain all of your freedoms when you go to prison, but it seems to be that they've infringed a bit too much in that regard, especially when it comes to work. Now, you having having been there before, I have numbers and it looks like it's different from system to system. But do you know offhand, like, is it mandatory when they tell you to work? Is it voluntary? Do you get to choose your job? What is the what, what does it look like? What does that system look like from the inside? So aside from a certain amount of just keeping up your um, living quarters, uh, inmates are expected to kind of clean their own um, living areas and common areas. Um, and they're inspected usually on a daily basis. Uh -huh. uh, but anything beyond that, so being in charge of keeping things clean or um, things like working in the kitchen or working in the laundry, they're jobs that are actually considered uh, privileges to have because otherwise you have nothing to do. You spend your entire day um, watching TV in a common area if you're lucky or just sitting in your room maybe reading a few books. So why then, if it's if it's just considered a privilege, would people be demanding better rights, more money? What what are the reforms that people are demanding if it's a privilege already? Well, so this kind of goes back to one of the things we discussed in a, a previous episode, where it's not necessarily a choice in the same way that we would consider a free choice, you know, out in the regular world. Because you're given the option of either um, do nothing, uh, sometimes even have punitive responses if you don't do a job more in prison than in jail. Uh, in prison, you are generally expected to have a prison job. Yeah. Uh, and if you do not work in prison, then you often will face retaliatory um, reactions from guards. That you won't officially be sanctioned, but you'll have privileges taken away um, and you'll get other infractions more easily. Right. Whether it's legal or not, there's a very well-documented, much-shared uh, experience with people saying, well, I didn't feel like doing their jobs for them. And so therefore, I got, you know, ever, anything from beat up to less rations for, you know, in food mm -hmm. and, and, and everything like that. And that is something that has been both documented and experiences that have been shared by prisoners. Uh, the so so the other the issue, key part of this though is the wages that go with it yes 
<laughs> I'm glad you thought that was a good transition to this because I agree. And that is the next part I was going to share. This is from Prison Policy. Uh, do check the show notes. There is a ton. But this is really the only one that I want to go over like word for word because it is hard to believe if I tell you in my voice. So from Prison Policy, one major surprise, major surprise, prisoners appear to be paying incarcerated people less today than they were in 2001. The average of the minimum daily wages paid to incarcerated workers for non-industrial prison jobs is now 86, 86 cents, down from 93 cents reported in 2001. The average maximum daily wage for the same prison jobs has declined more significantly from $4.73 in 2001 to $3.45 today. So we're going in the wrong direction as far as paying them wages. Now, a lot of people would say these are prisoners. They've lost their rights. They're lucky to be making anything. I know what I would tell them. What would you tell them? Well, I would also uh, ask what happens to those wages that they make, because in a lot of cases, uh, they don't actually go to the inmates themselves. Um, they don't even have an opportunity to spend them because they're taken for my favorite fee being room and board. Yeah. So we are going to take away, uh, you know, you're going to be punished. We're going to force you to live here and then force you to pay for it as well. Um, we're going to give you the opportunity to have a job that we will punish you for not taking. and then any money that you make from that well you have to pay us back for your room and board so if i uh, and to put this in perspective if i work a 10 hour day at at four dollars an hour or whatever i can make 40 bucks and with that 40 dollars, i could go in my hometown there's a hotel that let me stay for 40 dollars. not a big room but somebody will clean the room fluff the sheets change my towels you're not exactly getting those same amenities when you pay for room and board in prison uh and on top of that, I guess I would just, on top of relating to what you just said, the other thing is these jobs, in looking through them, they tend to be custodial, maintenance, groundkeeping, food service jobs, jobs that the institutions themselves are required to do. They are just able to delegate them out to prisoners. So, fun story. Let me tell you about my my jail job okay um when you work uh, a job in most jails uh it's you're actually considered a contractor and you're not working for the jail directly or the prison directly in my case uh, i was working for our mark which is a common uh, contractor to both uh, jails prisons schools mo lots of institutions uh lots of big employers have our mark as their um like cafeteria um contractor so technically, I was working for our mark, okay. and they compensated me with $2 a day that covered the $2 a day that I was charged for room and board. So got nothing from that. Okay. Um, Did not receive plus, any of it. Okay. Right. Plus a $10 credit for anything that I wanted to buy from the commissary, which they ran per week. Oh, okay. So that's not, that doesn't get to leave with you when you're out of prison or jail. Right. No. Yeah. No. So you're doing, all of you know you're you're doing work it's it's good that you're having something to do that you're being somewhat productive because otherwise you know that's that's a whole other level of difficulty in jail is the 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 things that happen to the human mind when you are stuck being unproductive and having nothing to do by force um so you're given something to do but you're not given a way to actually better yourself once you're outside of jail, it's it's no it serves no rehabilitative effect at that point. Yeah. And and I mean, just from an out, outsider's perspective, it looks like they're paying. They're actually well, I'd say paying. They're not paying people to do the jobs that they are supposed to do mm -hmm. for them. It seems very lazy, I guess, it, to say we have the staff and the people to to do this food court ourselves. But it's more we're cost gonna, effective, though. Yeah, we're going to and that that's more cost effective and you're paying you're not actually paying them to do it for you. So I imagine that they don't all of a sudden fire their food workers or anything like that, like or, or, or do they plan on prisoners so much that they would actually lay off their own employees in the prison? They never plan to hire employees in the first place. The actual um, staff uh, that is provided by like Aramark is very minimal in these situations. They hire prisoners to like the entire kitchen staff, I believe there's um, maybe one 
um, person who oversees the kitchen staff, but otherwise it's entirely uh, inmate labor. Oh, wow. So from the get go, they just they plan on paying somebody pretty much nothing to run Mm -hmm. these things for them. And that's why and we've talked about this before. We're capital prison industrial complex. Yes, prison industrial complex. And it it seems like it'd be one of those things. Oh, we love industrialism. We love capitalism. But when you have no competition and the participants aren't able to leave your system. Yeah, things get a little take advantage of E there. Uh, when you're I wonder not if anybody. Yeah, and I wonder if anybody in this point has had the thought that I quickly occurred to me, which is, well, this kind of sounds like slavery with extra steps. Um, uh, so they actually, on the inside, called this uh, prison slavery. During the hunger strike uh, from the prisons a month ago, this is one of the things that they called for was the end of prison slavery. And I had to look it up and I said, uh, uh, what is prison slavery? Are they really slaves? And like you said, it seems like they get a choice, but they really don't. They're going to be working. And if they're not, they're going to be very much belittled. And either way, somebody's going to be working those jobs between... What? their prison or all the prisoners yeah the messed up part though is that even if it is slavery it's still legal they're prisoners and that's and that's really uh, that's the heartbreaking part about this and that's the thing that i think we as libertarians need to get into is what what rights do they lose what rights do they retain is there still a political and moral duty duty to these prisoners what's our obligation as me as a guy who will probably never break the law because i'm too afraid except that i always accidentally break the law like everybody else not knowing it whatever they estimated like three times a day like average person does like three felonies a day without realizing Mm -hmm. it you know but as somebody like me who just pretend i don't know that statistic I i never break the law why why should i care these people broke the law why 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 am i fighting for their rights what would you tell someone like that? You never know when you might end up in that situation. Um, I, I actually think one purpose that I've served to a lot of people that I've talked to is giving them a visual example of someone who you would never expect to be uh, a felon or someone who's been to jail, but has. Yeah. Because like you said, you know, it's so easy to unintentionally or even just in the course of making poor decisions um run afoul of the law and end up in that situation and you got to consider what might happen if you or someone that you love ends up in that situation statistically it's likely one i think what is it one out of three americans um at some point in their life something like that i uh, i have a stat that i don't know i feel like that's really high we're five times anybody else in the world to send you to prison yeah So, I mean, it's it's very likely compared to any other country in the world that you're going to get sent to prison. Oh, uh, seven hundred and fifty six per one hundred thousand of the national pop. Oh, is currently behind bars. Oh, yeah. So it's not high. Yeah, there's there's currently like one and a half percent of people are in jail or prison or on probation. Yeah. And uh, 76 percent of those people in prison. uh, Victimless crime. So that's that's just another tidbit for your libertarian hat there uh, that it's easy to think of them all as murderers and thieves. And me being a minarchist, I understand the need for a prison. Um, I think that even in an anarchist society, we would have an area, a timeout area for people that were bad. Right. So I think in some rate, it's going to be hard to dispose of a prison system entirely. And I'm definitely not proposing that. But certainly we should keep it rare, especially if me, the average taxpayer, is paying for these people to go to prison. You want to keep it rare anyway. But it's not as rare as it should be, like you're saying. And well, I think I think part of the problem with that is considering jail as kind of like an adult timeout, because that's not what it is. Like jail is far more impactful on people's lives than an adult timeout. It's taking someone away from their entire livelihood generally people it's not uncommon for people to lose their housing to lose their job um to have significant issues with family oftentimes to lose custody of their kids i mean it's it's really crazy the amount of things that can happen because you went to jail and i know we're getting a little off on the tangent because i knew we would but but i mean (laughs) i I I want to ask you a question yeah go ahead we have this, you know, this inmate labor. Okay. Why are we talking about it? What has um, happened that 
well, how did the inmates take use of their labor recently? So one of the what, what you're saying, like why the hunger strike happened or like what what has been happening with labor recently that's got it under the microscope? Well, I'm specifically talking about um, the, the labor strikes, you know, that it makes a difference that when prisoners don't do their jobs because they're running the prisons. So this was kind of an effective method during both the hunger. strike. It was actually not just a hunger strike, although that got a lot of the, the attention. Um, we actually had a video of that, which is why it got a lot of the attention. But it was a labor strike as well. They called for that. The thing is, these prisons can't function without it. And that's what really puts it under the microscope. These are supposed to be functional prisons for people who maybe you don't want around other people, even other prisoners, right? And mm -hmm. so the issue is then you put them in these situations where not only do we require them to be around other people, we need we need them to be around other criminals, uh, which might not be the best for their health either. Health either. And so what's going on is we're saying, hey, you can't fit in with normal society. What I would retort and what seems to have come into light here is you say, okay, these people can't function in society. Now, 86% of victimless crime can. So, But for the 14% that, that can't function in normal society, you're still creating a society in prison. What type of society can they function in? And so I would say that even though these prison conditions don't seem like they matter to you because you might not find yourself in prison, uh, I think the something, oh, I had a statistic here. Most of these people are going back out. Even the ones on, yeah. on violent crimes are going back out on the street. And so we need a society in prison conducive to creating them, creating people that can function in our society. Instead, the society in prison is one of... You're encouraged to join a gang for your own protection. You're encouraged to sneak stuff in. There, there's a. I mean, you could listen to some of our the cost episodes on Weird Libertarians. Um, Jerome's story, where he talks about being on the inside, and and he's got two episodes, and and how that doesn't work out. And I just, I would just say that this type of society, and this, and specifically abusing these wages, does not teach people what they should do when they get a job on the outside because that's not how it works they're they're taught that they have to you don't have to and then they confront when they're on the outside to say oh i don't have to get a job nobody's making me anymore you haven't taught them anything you know you haven't shown them the opportunity you haven't given them you haven't shown them profit like you said from their labor and so there's just numerous problems with the labor system because it's not conducive to rehabilitation it's conducive to making money for our or saving money for our government Right. You know, and it, it's it goes back to kind of what we were talking about, the the whole idea of, you know, it's this is a, a whole system and a complex and it really does rely on this inmate labor um, so much so that, you know, there was I want to say it was in Texas a couple of years ago that um, their incarceration rates were falling and they had um, prison guard unions who were lobbying for um, more strict enforcement because they didn't want to lose jobs by having less inmates. It's it's really important to sometimes look at these systems and say, is, is this what we want to keep um, perpetuating? Um, and to the to the point about, you know, slavery being legal, that's constitutional. That's part of the 14th Amendment. It specifically says uh, that slavery is illegal except in the case of um, except in the case of a, as a punishment for crime. Yeah, it's, it's punishment, not re rehabilitation. It is. And, and what, what you're touching on now is we're talking about recidivism. They're creating a society that puts people back on the street, streets and expects them back. Uh, let's see here. I have a statistic. Teach people how to be an underclass. Yeah, you teach people how to be an underclass. Class, you teach them how to live in prison. You teach them, how, you know, this system, and then and you then you blame them for acting like it. Correct. And so there is some. Even a, I think that this is what I was really going for. Here's my long game: is I say, well, maybe I'll never be in prison, but my life might might, might be impacted by somebody who has gone to prison. Probably will be. Like, if it's not me, somebody I know has definitely gone to jail or prison and been a part of this system. And would I rather they have gone to a place that teaches them how to interact with me positively? 
or would I rather go to a place that teaches them to look out for only themselves and be mistrustful of people who try to steal their money constantly and act like and treat them like slaves. And so then when they get out, they don't know how to function. It ends up impacting me one way or the other. Plus, when they go back to prison, I paid for it the first time. I'm paying for it the second time, too. Why do I want to use my hard earned wages to house somebody who's committing crimes against me when I could say, let's develop it. I'll pay I'll pay some money to get them out of my face for a minute and then make it so that when they come back, they don't want to get in my face anymore. Um, the I wish I uh, I got like a million stats and unfortunately, it's just all a big wreck. So, so we're just going to have to check the show notes. But the problem is that a lot of these people are going out and coming back because there is no rehabilitatory process. And the rehabilitation is a lot cheaper than keeping them in jail and getting them rehoused in jail. And those who have had access to rehabilitation, while it costs money, keeps them out of prison. And that is cheaper than not offering rehabilitation and developing people that are on a lifetime of crime. Hmm. The... um. <sighs> What did you hear about the prison strike that that happened like a month ago? I, I knew about the hunger part of it. Did you hear about it at all? I did. It was a lot of the things about it were it, it's kind of hard to get clear figures on it because uh, you're dealing with, you know, people outside of these institutions trying to figure out what's going on inside. And in a lot of cases uh, for prisoners, even just bringing information out or contacting journalists can be very dangerous. You know, they're in a situation where the people who they are protesting against are also in control of every aspect of their lives. They literally can lock them in a room for 23 hours a day um, and lock them in a slightly bigger room for one other hour a day. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm not even kidding. Like this, this is what is allowed and is, is in our legislation. And you have to kind of consider that in figuring out how effective uh, it was and how widespread it was. In some states, there were reports that um, there were no strikes at all, whereas in other states there were um, supposedly very effective strikes that, you know, got the attention of the governors. Um, but none of them seem to really have any actual effect on policy reform, and and that's the unfortunate thing about these protests is it it really relies on those of us who who do have power who are enfranchised because in a lot of these cases, uh, you know, these people are obviously. In only two states, they can vote in jail or prison, and um, everywhere else, they Maine may not Vermont. even be able to. Those yes, the only two. Yep. <laughs> and and people will go to the prisons um, to campaign, actually, because you have a captive audience, literally. <laughs> sure. uh, but uh, so people in prison, you know, it's a great way to get them involved in civics and back into their community. But it's also one of the most common things that we strip people of. We strip people of their voice and the ability to actually make change in the systems that they're subjected to. So it's really important for us to listen and for us to actually contact our legislators and, and push for criminal justice reform. It's, it's final thought time. And for me, I am just going to say that what Sarah said about them being a captive audience they have the opportunity for like every second of their day to be taught something. Everybody's learning all the time, but what are you teaching them? So if we take the majority of their day and say, we're going to exploit you for labor, you've kind of taught them that society's exploitative and you need to get away with whatever you can get away with. And you're not entitled to the wages or to the things that you earn. They are very desensitized to, um, to, to being to their rights, I guess they're, they're disenfranchised from their rights of, of what they have. And so specifically with prison labor, I am OK with a system of labor if it's fair and it's voluntary and they earn it because those are the type of skills that they are going to need to know on the outside. And moreover, that's the type of philosophy that they'll need to know to integrate with the outside again, to say that if I understand that I'm entitled to my wages, and that if I do this work, I get this money, they come to have a positive relationship with work, as opposed to a negative relationship with it, and a positive relationship with guards, officers. Instead of seeing them as overlords, they say, oh yeah, I work next to that guy. I remember him treating me like part of the team. 
And so I, I, that's my final thought that this is this will help you as a non prison slash jail goer. It'll save you money and it'll decrease your chance of getting robbed if we treat these people fairly and pay them fairly. And with that, that's I true. will turn the time over to you. Well, I feel like I, I, you know, said my bit before it's this is really, you know, a an important issue that if those of us on the outside do not pay attention to, then no change will happen because those who are being subjected to these policies don't have any power to change them. Yeah, it's uh, guys, if you like what Sarah and I are doing, we love doing it every week, but we can't do it without you. So please share it. If you listen to us, you help us a little bit. If you share it, you help us a lot. If you subscribe, you help us big time. If you subscribe on Patreon, I kiss your feet. You are everything to us. So just please to keep the We Are Libertarians Network alive. This is a new venture for me and Sarah. We're new, new to the network. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe. Please subscribe on Patreon. Please tell editor at wearelibertarians.com or, or just Chris if you find him on Facebook. Let him know somehow that we are one of the good things happening. And if you disagree, then just keep your trap shut. Well, I like feedback. <laughs> I don't mind a little constructive criticism, but... But either way, thank you for listening. Bingo. All right, you have a good one. <laughs>